Hello, my name is Dr. Benjamin Abella. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have just attended the late-breaking clinical trial session at the American Heart Association meeting in 2013 here in Dallas. And I'm with two of my colleagues who are also discussants at the late-breaking clinical trials session, Dr. Marat Kastren I'm from Sweden, and Dr. Kathy Sila, a neurologist, who will be sharing each of them uh, the trials that they were discussants uh, on. I was a discussant on a trial uh, pertaining to post-arrest uh, care, and as you both know, uh, the trial I was discussing involved the cooling of patients following uh, cardiac arrest at two different temperatures, 33 versus 36, uh, a remarkable trial. It included almost a thousand patients, um, with the fundamental finding um, being that there wasn't a difference in outcomes when patients were cooled to either 33 or 36 degrees centigrade, um, which is uh, a remarkable study and a remarkable finding, um, in, in part because now I have no idea what to do for patients following cardiac arrest. We have a protocol where if you've had a cardiac arrest, we cool to 33. Um, and I know we're going to have a lot of hard work to do. Am I, am I right? Perhaps you could talk a little bit to that. And what, what do you think you, we should do for these patients? Well, it, it showed that it's very important to temperature management, uh, take care of that as a, as a part of the bundle of care as we do. The, the problem I see there is that, that if we start uh, calling pre hospitally which I still think we should do, even if uh, my study that I was discussing showed that fluid, vol cold fluid volume post-arrest in the pre-hospital setting was not beneficial. We still have the intra-arrest part. So if I call intra-arrest with whatever intranasal or, or other methods, and then I bring the patient cool down to the hospital and you guys want to have it at 36, we need to really see how that chain of temperature management will catch all this. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think one of the fundamental points from both of the trials we reviewed, and I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about that trial, is just how much more work remains to be done in post-arrest care. Uh, we've had uh, pitifully few clinical trials looking at post-arrest care and post-arrest hypothermia, and we need more. I'm sure you'd agree with that statement Yeah, as well. and I think both of these studies show that we can do big, good studies in the pre-hospital care, in cardiac arrest, uh, multi-center or single center, so it was uh, it was nice. Yeah, well, why don't you talk a little bit about your study, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Sayla to talk about hers as well. Yeah, well, in my study, the Seattle EMS gave uh, patients that had cardiac arrest after they had already got the heart beating again. They gave them cold fluid, two liters, very fast, which is a little bit problematic since uh, fluid volume loading will uh, strain the heart a little bit, and uh, this is not very beneficial. And they didn't see any uh, difference between those that are called in the hospital. Um, but as I already said, we still have the intra-arrest uh, period that we need to focus on now and see if that would be beneficial. Not with fluids though, but other methods. And do I hear a future clinical trial uh, in the works? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, uh, Dr. Newmar told about the intra-arrest uh, calling with the post-calling in the hospitals with rats. And we actually have a study already going on with 250 patients included in the multicenter setting. So I hope that we can continue with that and come up with good results. Dr. Sila, perhaps you can tell us about the study that you were the discussant on. Well, I really resonate with this whole concept that we need more data, and particularly for these very common and vexing problems that we deal with all the time. I, I mean, the message was, you know, use your best clinical judgment for, for my study. So um, it, acute stroke hypertension management um, remains a major issue for clinicians in terms of what orders do we write on patients, how do we manage that blood pressure. Um, so this trial, this, it was a Chinese trial of over 4,000 patients. This is the largest trial that's ever been done in acute blood pressure management for ischemic stroke patients. And instead of a trial of a drug, it was a trial of a target. So the design was to lower the blood pressure between 10 and 25% over the first 20, uh, 24 hours, and then reach a target of less than 140, 90 over the first seven days. And the conclusion of the study was that that active blood pressure management 
did not reduce their primary endpoint of death and disability at 14 days or hospital discharge compared to a strategy of just stopping all their home blood pressure medications and not treating blood pressure. Now, the problem with this um, is that uh, it, it's, it, it's a negative trial in the sense that it didn't improve therapy. From my standpoint is that it really didn't harm the patients either. And so there is a take home message from this. Um, for the patients that were entered into the trial, which are pretty much described as not in the very hyperacute period, um, moderate levels of hypertension, modestly, modestly small strokes, their NIH stroke scale was four, which is a pretty minor stroke. Um, two thirds of them could be discharged to home and could even live independently. So they really weren't very disabling strokes to begin with that um, they didn't see stroke progression. And as a Chinese trial, length of stay was 13 days. You know, we don't do that here in the US, but the nice part about it was that they kept them there for 13 days. So you would think that if something would have happened like stroke progression from too aggressive blood pressure management, that that would have been seen, there would have been a signal in the trial. So I, I think we do have some guidance about, at least for a subset of patients, you know, how we can manage blood pressure in that acute setting. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I'm struck by, I'd be curious to hear both your thoughts, that one of the unifying themes of uh, our studies is two of the three studies we looked at were not done in the United States. And we're here at the American Heart Association that supports largely research done in the United States. And personally, I see a glaring problem that for a lot of these complex trials, fewer and fewer are taking place in the U.S. and more and more happening overseas. I wonder if you have thoughts on that issue. For, for me, I find that problematic in the cardiac rest realm. I, I don't know if, you, if that's a general trend in neurology yeah, as well. well I can just comment about the device that we're using. I know that it's, it's uh, hard to get it approved in the USA because the Americans uh, think that something's done outside the USA is not very uh, generalizable to, to the patients here. So it means that, that you really need to do the same studies outside and inside the United States. So I think, once again, like Dr. Chamberlain said years ago, we need collaboration because we have the knowledge together. Mm -hmm. and, and we certainly need collaboration in the sense that, at least for the stroke trials, strokes that occur in the Chinese population are of different subsets. And it may not be generalizable mm -hmm. to European populations, Indian populations, mm -hmm. African American populations. I mean, we need that diversity of involvement so that we really want, know what to do for each of our patients. Yeah, I would imagine, especially in something like hypertension management, where there are genetic factors that play a large role in response to different class of medications, that's really important. Certainly. So uh, I've enjoyed our conversation, and uh, hopefully, viewers will have gained some insights into the studies. And uh, I think it was a very exciting day. I think so too, and, and some bricks of the fundamental to evidence-based uh, care has been laid here.